Many of us have nicknames. Uh, when we grow up, nicknames are oftentimes given to us, um, usually by parents or by siblings, um, whether it's Noodles or Pumpkin or Missy or Bugsy, Sissy, Freckles, Bones. It's usually not something we give to ourselves, right? Nicknames are not usually something we give to us. My name is Joe, but call me Muscles. Right? That these are not sort of the things that, 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 that we do. We don't, we don't identify something about our, our person and say, this will be my nickname. Let's go over to the book of Acts and let's see an individual that had a nickname. Uh, Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 and verse... 36, uh, here at the end of this chapter, Acts chapter 4 and verse 36, we see Luke, who's the author of the book of Acts, we see him writing this, he says, Joseph, who is also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, he was a Levite of the country of Cyprus. Uh, and it goes on, verse 37, saying that he had some land, he sold it, and he gave it to the apostles. Joseph here doesn't give himself the name Barnabas, right? He doesn't say, oh, my name is Joseph, but you can call me Barnabas. Right? He, he's, he's named this by the apostles. His name is Joseph, um, but he was also named Barnabas by the apostles. The, the apostles are the ones that sort of gave him this nickname, if you will. And we see the translation here. Luke tells us that Barnabas means son of encouragement, Barnabas is likely uh, a cousin to, um, to Mark. Uh, you can see that reference over in Colossians uh, chapter 4 and verse 10, uh, that Barnabas and, and Mark uh, were cousins. Paul makes that connection for us in Colossians 4 and verse 10. Uh, Barnabas would later become a, a, a great mentor to, to Mark. But here we have this individual uh, that's identified for us with this, with this interesting nickname. Joseph or Joseph would be another rendering of it, nicknamed uh, Barnabas, meaning encouragement. Uh, it can also mean comfort or exhortation. Some have nicknames based on our, our physical features. Uh, maybe your nickname growing up was Slim or Four Eyes or Freckles or something. Some of them can be maybe uh, more on the derogatory term as, you know, we're going through elementary school and kids are picking on us and they call us four eyes maybe or they, they pick out, you know, some facial feature, some body feature and they, they give us that nickname. But some of us have nicknames based on characteristics that we have. Barnabas here has a nickname of encouragement uh, based on not a, a physical feature, but based on sort of a, a, a type of personality, a, a type of focus that he has in his life. What would it say of our life? If, if someone, if, if, if you had to give yourself a nickname, which is sort of uncommon, but just consider this just for a moment. If someone were to give you a nickname, what do you think that that nickname might be? Would your nickname be you know, peaceful or, or kind. Hi, I'd like to introduce you to, 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 to kindness. Or how, uh, you should be careful of a uh, uh, complainer over there, <laughs> right? Ne never happy. <laughs> um, would our nickname indicate that we were outgoing? Or a person, maybe, maybe you would be called the food bringer. Uh, this is so-and-so, but we like to refer to them as the bringer of food because right? they're always bringing food over to people who are in need. Joseph's nickname here meant encouragers, and any nickname says a lot about us, right? Whether our nickname is something like freckles or four eyes that in some ways sort of makes fun of some of our character traits, it still says something about us, doesn't it? Yeah, we do have some freckles, and yeah, we do wear glasses and need some sort of corrective lens. But it can also say things about our traits, about our skills. Hey, you should go talk to so-and-so. They're a great handyman. In some ways, it's, 
it, it reflects back on their traits, on their skills maybe, on their personality. Here with Joseph, it reflects back on where his focus is. He has a, a focus a, about encouraging other people. In this world that we live in, it's, it's a busy world. And this busy world is very self-focused and self-interested. It's a focus on, on, on what is important to me and the things that surround me. But God desires that we would be outward in our attention, out, outwardly focused. But this takes conscious effort. This takes sacrifice, even. And so for us to, to have a nickname like food bringer or... Uh, a, a, a giver of everything that we have or something similar or encourager, it, it, it takes a conscious effort. So in the sermon today, I want to discuss three different ways that we can be encouragers. And through these three ways, hopefully we can begin to exercise this godly trait. Because encouraging is something that doesn't come natural to us. To encourage someone else isn't necessarily easy. To encourage someone else takes conscious thought and effort. Uh, it doesn't just naturally exude from us. Again, even within the society that we live in, uh, it's, it's much more easier to, to talk about ourselves and talk about our challenges, our problems, the things going on with our week and our life to be an encourager means we have to turn that focus and point it in a different direction. So the first way that we can encourage others is to encourage them for growth. Encourage for growth. The early history of the first century church was one of monumental circumstances. We see a lot of, pos a lot of powerful examples uh, in that first century uh, there were many people coming to know God, coming to his way of life, thousands of people being baptized. Uh, it, in that way, it would have been a tremendous time to have lived. But we also know that that same time frame brought a lot of persecutions and challenges as well, a lot of struggles and difficulties. Uh, if you go forward just a couple chapters to chapter 7, uh, Acts chapter 7, We see uh, the, the bulk of chapter 7 is a, a, essentially a sermon that Stephen gives. He's recently ordained in the, the previous chapter, and he's coming before sort of this, this type of inquisition. He's being questioned by, by the high priest. And in verse 2, he, he begins to respond to the priest, to the high priest, and he goes on for quite some time recounting Israel's history. Verse 2, brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. And he goes through and he talks a little bit about, about him. At the end of verse 8, he talks about the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then... Jacob's 12 sons, the patriarchs. And in verse 9, then he begins to talk about those 12 sons and the, the tribes that they turn into. We see Moses coming on the scene. He describes a lot of Israel's history. Verse 35, we, we rejected Moses. Moses responds, again, he's reiterating this history that, that they all know. Coming down to verse, uh, verse 54, we see that they were not happy with this message, not happy with this recounting of, of their history from a perspective that they were in the wrong, right? The, the Jewish leaders, the high priests, those listening to Stephen felt that they were justified, felt that they were righteous, felt that they were doing the right thing. Uh, and through this, this recounting of their own history, Stephen puts them on the block and says, no, you have rejected God. You've gone off and you've done something else. 
Verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears. They ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the city and they stoned him. We see here that Saul, uh, before his conversion, Saul is called. Um, this incident takes place uh, essentially at the hand of Saul and because of his, his directives. But then we come down to verse 8 and we see something interesting happening. In verse 3, we see that Saul continues to make havoc of the church. He's entering the houses. He's dragging people off in order to imprison them. He's continuing to cause great havoc. Uh, it didn't just begin and end with, uh, with, with Stephen, but it continues on. In chapter 9, verse 1, we see Saul is still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He goes to the high priest and and petitions that his scope would be expanded, that he could have sort of ultimate authority to bring these, these people uh, to, to prison, that he might bind them and, and bring them before the justices there. But then we see something interesting happen. We, we're probably familiar with the story. Verse 3, he evidently receives those, those orders, that authority. He goes off. And suddenly, verse 3, a light shines around him. He falls to the ground, and the voice from heaven questions him. What are you doing? Why are you doing these things? What's going on here? And Saul attempts to justify himself. Again, he's made blind. Uh, Ananias uh, is petitioned here in verse 10 by God to go and have a conversation with Saul to eventually uh, uh, anoint him. Uh, at the end of verse 18, we see Saul being baptized. Uh, and so there's this huge change from this one individual that, that you know, commands the stoning uh, of, of Stephen uh, all the way through this habit that he's reaching within the, the church, families that he's breaking up, all to the point that now Saul is converted, he's baptized, he has God's spirit Uh, chapter uh, verse 26, sorry, chapter, chapter 9, verse 26, when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him. Right? Those disciples had put Saul into a box, and they were, they were a little leery of him. Our first point here is to, to encourage people toward growth encourage people toward growth. When we put people in a box, then we, we limit their growth. We limit their growth. Now, it, on one way, we could say, well, the, the disciples here were just being cautious. They, they knew of Saul. <laughs> they, they, they knew that, that he would, you know, likely haul people off, that he had these authorities from the high priest. So, in one way, you could justify and say, well, they were just being careful. But no doubt during this time, News traveled fast, and Ananias had previously baptized him, laid his hands on him. God had restored his sight, had given him of his spirit. But yet in verse 26, we see the disciples still keeping Paul in this, or Saul in this box. This guy's not to be trusted. He's done this, these terrible things in the past. This is who he is. Right? We're going to put him in this box, and this is who he is, and we're not going to let him out. Verse 27, we see Barnabas coming along. Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and they had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. Right? So, yes, with God's inspiration, with God's direction, Saul is sort of accepted, you might say. But from a human perspective, Barnabas here is very much central to, to what is happening. Barnabas steps in and says, no, no, let's break down that box that you've put Saul in. He's done these good things. God has called him. He's changed his life. He's repented. And now he's preaching boldly the name of Jesus. Let's take him out of that box and let's get rid of the box, essentially Barnabas is saying. 
Encouragers don't profile people. And encouragers don't, don't leave them in these boxes. We as humans love our boxes, though. We love boxes. We have boxes for everyone. Oh, be careful with that person because at one point in the past, they hurt me. Or at one point, they did this. Or at one point in their history, I heard from so-and-so who heard it from so-and-so that this is what they said, and that was a bad thing. And so I'm going to put them in this box. Encouragers don't leave people in boxes. Maybe as we age, we, we, we see the younger generations coming up behind us, and we look at them and say, oh, I remember that kid when, I remember that person when he was a kid. Right. Oh, he was, a, he was an unruly sort. Right. And, and we sort of put him in the box. And yeah, he might be 20, 30, 40, 50 years old, but we still remember him back as that unruly kid, don't we? People grow up. People mature. People change. Barnabas here looks at Saul's fruit. He looks at his fruit. And he says, you know, he's, he's had this interaction with God. He's been baptized. I see the fruit of God's Spirit working in him. He's preaching boldly the name of Jesus. He doesn't need to be in this box, guys. Let's take him out. Let's acknowledge the work that God is doing in him and through him. Barnabas looked at Saul's fruit and saw that his nature was in the process of being changed and was now preaching the Christ. But it's easy to hold people's sins in front of them and to hold their shortcomings over them. This is, this is a sad tendency that we have as humans. Something happens to us and that memory is sort of written in, in sort of a hard way into our minds. And every time we see someone, we think back to that memory. Don't ask so-and-so to help. She tends to drop things. <laughs> Last time they were at my house, they blank. It's all too easy to put somebody in a box than to never let them out. I knew a pastor at one point that uh, moved into an area and someone came to him and said, let me tell you about everything the members in this congregation have ever done. (laughs) Boxes, lots of boxes. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 verse 22. This is where we want to be. And so the point here is to encourage others toward growth. So let's be mindful that where we want us to be in the sight of God is where we also try to help others be in their walk with God. Ephesians 4 and verse 22, uh, put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and become renewed and, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. God expects us to change. He expects us to change. And so as we're dealing with other individuals, especially those within the house of God, we also should be expecting that that God is doing the same thing with them. He doesn't want the old man. If he did, then there's no need for baptism, is there? The old man would be okay. Your old self would be good enough. But this is this is not the truth of God's word. He he does want change. He wants change in us, but the point here is about how we view others. And so let's consider Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 24, from the perspective that as much as God wants us to change, God wants the other person to change as well. And we should be there encouraging that growth that God is doing in and through that person. We should be careful that we don't expect people not to grow and change. I know there's a lot of negative words in there. Don't expect people not to grow and change. We could clean it up and say, expect people to grow. Expect them to grow. 
expect them to change. Will they have bumps and bruises and uh, shortcomings along the way? Well, sure, who of us doesn't, right? And if we take the honest look at ourselves, we do the same thing, right? We have bumps and bruises and shortcomings, and we're not always completely in line with, with, with God. And sometimes we let our thoughts rule over us, and we don't, oh, sorry, we don't bring that back into captivity. Others have the same, the same challenges just like we do. And so it's important for us to, to be that encourager, but, but be that encourager for their growth. Similarly, as we want them to encourage us in our growth. Let's get rid of our boxes that we uh, have traditionally put people in. Now let's go over to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. The apostle writes, he says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. Infants are, are, are beautiful. Babies, new babies are precious and helpless all at the same, all at the same time. But they desire that milk from, from their mom. They, they, they desire that, that ability to grow, to, to be nourished. What Peter here is writing about is, is not about the milk. It's not about the milk. The focus of what he's pointing us to is that we lay aside the sins, that, that, that we turn to God and we acknowledge his way of life that we need in order to grow. We desire the pure milk of the word. Desire God's way of life to be in us so that we can grow. And so if we take this and apply it to our first point here about encouraging others toward growth, this is some of that framework. Right? We also should encur be encouraging others to overcome their sins as much as we're overcoming our sins. And that we should see the desire in others that they also are pursuing God's way of life. They're also studying and praying about God's word and, and, and that they also have this desire to grow. This is the focus here of what, what Peter is talking about. Lay aside those sins. Focus on the words of life and grow. Grow spiritually. Number two, the second way that we can encourage others is to encourage them for their potential. Encourage them for their potential. Back in the book of Acts in chapter 14 and verse 14, we see Saul at this point in his life had taken on the Greek version of his name. Remember that there was no name change when, when Christ had that conversation with him. Um, back in the early chapters of, of Acts, after S Stephen's death, there was not a blindness on the road to Damascus, and oh, by the way, with your baptism, here's your new name, right? There, there was no official name change. When Saul is dealing with the Jews, he goes by his Hebrew name of Saul, right? But as we see him begin to move out into those Gentile countries, we see Luke begin to refer to him uh, according to that Greek version of Saul, Right, which is the, the, the name Paul. So in the middle part of Acts chapter 14, we see Saul is now taking on this Greek version of his name. He's being referred to and written um, by his name Paul. And both he and Barnabas are now considered uh, apostles. Uh, and we see that again, Acts chapter 14 uh, and verse 14 makes that, makes that connection. I want to go, though, to chapter 15. So we have Paul now considered an apostle. We have Barnabas considered an apostle. The very next chapter, chapter 15 uh, and verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back 
and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord, and let's see how they're doing. Right? Let's circle back around. We, we've been at this for some time, and it's time now to, to retrace our steps and, and to look in with our eyes on these people that we've interacted with. Verse 37, now Barnabas was determining to take with him John, called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take with them Mark for various reasons. In verse 39, then the contention became so sharp that they, parted, that they departed from one another, and so Barnabas took Mark, sailed to Cyprus, Paul chose Silas, and departed. So they each sort of took an assistant, since they couldn't agree on the same assistant, they took separate assistants, you might say, and sort of went uh, a different direction, still accomplishing this, this goal of being able to loop back around and visit these congregations. Paul here and Barnabas have a disagreement, but it's important to note they didn't let it erode their relationship or their purpose. Right? One of them didn't say, ah, oh, well, fooey with this, I'm headed to Italy. I'm, I'm headed to the new world. I'm, I'm done with this. I'm going to wash my hands and I'm going to walk out. Right? They did not let it erode their relationship. And more importantly, they didn't let it erode the purpose and calling that God had given to them. They realized the job that they were each given by God to do. They wanted to do it different ways. And we know, though, that from Scripture, they were both successful on this second visiting tour. Barnabas, though, sees potential in Mark. He sees a potential in Mark, and he wants to have some time to further develop and refine that potential. He wanted to continue teaching him and training him. You can write down your notes for a later reference, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 11. Paul circles back around, and he sees the value now in Mark. At, at this point, he was in chapter 15 here, he's, he's a little burned by Mark. But later on in his ministry, he sees value in Mark. And he compliments Barnabas there in 2 Timothy. He compliments Barnabas that Mark had become useful to him, to Paul. It was good that Barnabas didn't give up on Mark and that he had continued to teach him and encourage him and continued to train him. Let's go to the book of John, uh, chapter 14. John chapter 14. Again, the point, the second point here is that we should encourage others for their potential. We, we live in a society where if you mess up one time, you're done for, right? You're, you're cut off. You're, you're in a, a, a heap of hurt with your boss, whatever the situation is. Family members draw the line. Nope, we're, we're done here. We should be encouraging others toward their potential, toward not only their short-term potential and fulfilling the calling that God has given to them, but their long-term potential as well. Notice here John chapter 14 and verse 2, in my father's house are many mansions. Uh, the word mansions there is a, a terrible translation. Uh, it's not that God the Father has this big gigantic compound with all these big mansions and one mansion has our name on it. Uh, this gives the wrong impression. It's totally the wrong word. Uh, it simply means a place to, to, to dwell, a place to remain. In my Father's house are, are many places to, to dwell, to remain. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus here is trying to comfort his, his disciples by saying, I'm going to prepare this place. I'm going to prepare a position, an opportunity. I, I, have a, I have a great future in mind for you. If you'll stay faithful, I have a great purpose for you. We can do great things together. So I'm going to go off and I'm going to prepare this opportunity, this, this position. We, we like to consider this again for us. Oh, Christ has gone off and oh, he's... He's working with me, baby. He's creating this great opportunity. 
We should also see this in light of others, though. We also should see this from their perspective, that God is also preparing an opportunity and a place for each of, each of us, and that it's good for us to encourage them in that, to encourage them in what Jesus Christ is doing in their life, the opportunity that he's preparing them for, the things that, that they get to do in this physical life to develop character and, and to show that they put God first and how they apply God in their lives so that these opportunities that, that the God family is developing for them can come full circle. We can be excited for us, but are we excited for, for others, specific others? And we can say, oh, God's doing a great work for all of his people. Right? And true, okay. That's sort of a generic statement, isn't it? But we can also look at this verse from a very specific individual person. I'm thankful for what God is, is doing in that person. Right? And I want to go encourage them because Christ has gone off to repair something great for that person. Right? And I want to go, I want to go talk to them. And, and I, I, I want us to talk about this, this verse and these things that God is doing in each of our lives. And like Paul said to the Romans, I, I want to be there so we can encourage each other. This is our future. And again, we can see this from a personal perspective, but the point of the sermon here is to encourage us to see it from the other person's perspective as well. Our potential as a member of the God family, but the other person that we're talking with before church or after church or that we pick up the phone call and, and call a friend that we've met at the feast or whatever, that, that's, their, that's their future too. So let's encourage each other in that beautiful future. Well, let's go back to Ephesians. Uh, this time, let's go to chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. Ephesians 2 and verse 19. Paul writes, he says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Our potential is encapsulated here in this verse. And in context of our sermon, the other person that we're talking with, the other person that we're engaged with, that, that we're having the conversation with, this, this is their future as well. Verse 20 uh, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. It's all too easy for us to see these verses, and while again we think on a very generic scale that yes, God's building this household, but this is my block. Right? And, and we sort of take these and we personalize it and say, yeah, there's this generic structure and yeah, God's working with people and he's building a church and yes, 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 but this is my block. This is what God's doing in me, through me, with me. But again, consider those other blocks. Yes, there's ours, but there's that friend of ours. There's that person we see at church each week who's slogging through life in some ways and in, 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 in scenarios not maybe not too different from what we are. Verse 21, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Our teens are given the same calling as their parents. Our teens have the same opportunity one day in the future to, to commit and be baptized and have that inclusion in the family of God. The young adults among us have the same calling as the seniors among us. The parents, the same calling as the grandparents. Our society, though, says that everyone's potential is not the same. I mean, this is the world we live into, that, that, that we live in. If, if we hire into a job, uh, typically, we stay at that job. Maybe there's a promotion, but, but typically, we, we stay in that, in that position. 
We never expect to hire in as a janitor and at some point become the CEO. It just, our society doesn't work that way. But in God's family, everyone has the potential of being a God being, of being welcomed into that eternal family of God. We all have that potential. We all have the same criteria to achieve that, but nonetheless, God has given each of us that precious calling. And so this is the potential of all those that God is calling and working with. And in this complicated and busy and distracted filled world, it's, it's easy to lose sight of that. It's easy to revert back into the world's thinking of, oh, that person has this, and so they'll likely be more successful, and this person doesn't quite, and they're going to struggle more. But the potential for all of God's people is a, a beautiful potential. Being a God being, living eternally with the God family. Our focus can easily shift, though. And we can blink a couple times, and all of a sudden our problems are right there, front and center. We should encourage others. Encourage others in this potential. Remind them of, their, of, of having a proper godly focus as we also need them to remind us, right? It's a, it's a family. It's, it, it's, a, it's a great big unit that we have here of being able to help and encourage and, and continue to spur each other toward righteousness. If we truly are stitched together, then one thread supports another, and that one supports another, and another, and another. And all of a sudden, we have this beautiful piece of, of garment that, that we can wear that's strong, that, that doesn't tear. In other places of the Bible, it describes this as being a kingdom of priests and teachers. Let's not lose sight of, of, of who we are now and who we're being trained for. And, and again, consider those things from the other per person's perspective. And let's, let's encourage each other in that. Uh, let's go back to 1 Peter again. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, for me, for the other person, for the other person who's battling and fighting their human nature just like we are, it's, it's reserved for them too. Let, let, let's encourage them in that. Things in this world do fade. Blue jeans fade. <laughs> Cars will rust. Vehicles develop engine problems. Even as humans, we grow old and we die. But the potential of those that God is working with never fails. It never fades. It never goes away. That potential remains a beautiful promise. Remains a beautiful promise for us, thankfully. I would like that. But it also remains a beautiful promise for you as well as I interact with you and you interact with others. And we have this beautiful family environment where we're stitched together, helping each other and encouraging each other through this beautiful inheritance here that Peter is describing, this inheritance that's, that's incorruptible, that's undefiled, that doesn't fade and rust and develop oil leaks. <laughs> Number three, uh, the third way we can encourage each other is to remain. Encourage each other to remain. Let's go back to the book of Acts one more time. Let's go to chapter 11. Let's encourage each other to remain. Acts chapter 11. Uh, 
And in verse... Uh, well, the context here in verse 19, uh, there's persecution that's going on. Um, verse 21, the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Uh, verse 22 of Acts chapter 11, the news of these things came to the, to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as, to go as, far as Antioch. The church leaders here call upon Barnabas, the encourager, the one that that's, has the other person in mind, that's, that's realizing their potential and helping them with, with growth, they send Barnabas to go out as far as Antioch. This is estimated to be a little more than 300 miles from Jerusalem to Antioch. And it's like us here in Sand Springs going down and around over to, uh, to Fort Worth. Uh, Verse 23, when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all with that purpose of heart. Notice the outward attention, right? He didn't go and say, you know what? I'm here. What's to eat? I'm here. Whoa, are my feet sore? Whoa, are my shoulders tight? Is there a masseuse in the house? (laughs) Travels have been difficult. I'm here. How can you help me? I know he's very outwardly focused, isn't he? He goes, he shows up, he's glad, he encourages them with purpose of of heart. Notice that they should continue with the Lord, that they should continue with the Lord. He encourages them to remain faithful, right? Yes, life is hard. Yes, Satan is throwing those darts faster, you know, more, uh, uh, faster now than he ever has. Right, but, but stay strong. Right? Consider this verse. Turn over here. Let's look at this. Remember what Jesus did here. Right? He's encouraging them in order to remain steadfast. Don't give up. Don't succumb to Satan. And, and, and he's encouraging the church in that way. The phrase here in verse 23 at the end it's in the New King James Bible. It's the words, they should continue with. Those four words, they should continue with. Those four words in our English Bible in the New King James Version is actually one Greek word. And that one Greek word means literally to remain or abide. To remain or abide. And so Barnabas here is encouraging them not just that they should sort of loosely continue with the Lord, right? Sort of follow him from behind. This is sort of the impression that's given the way it's translated in our English Bibles. Yeah, as long as you can still see him out there, then you're still continuing the same path. The Greek word here, though, they should continue with, those four words. The Greek word, the single Greek word, means to remain or abide, Right? So it's not that God's way of life is sort of out there at a distance and you're sort of loosely connected and ah, when it's convenient, right? when it benefits, when it has some benefit back to me. No, Barnabas is, is encouraging them to remain. Stay connected, stay tight, abide with. Right? Abide with. That's not sort of, you stay at that hotel, I'm going to be down the road a ways, right? but I'll get the top floor so that I can still see your hotel. Right? That's not abiding with. Right? Barnabas is encouraging them to, to, to abide with Christ. Be close to him. This Greek word is only used six times. And, and, and this is what it means, to, to remain or to abide with. The old King James means to cleave unto Right, that's the phrase it uses. It's still the same Greek word, but the Old King James Bible, if you have that, it says essentially to cleave unto. And I kind of like that translation better than the New King James, because if we cleave to something, I mean, we're, we're holding on to it, aren't we? Right, we're, we're holding on to it. We, we've got our arms wrapped around it, maybe a leg. Right, we're, we're, we're cleaving on to it. We're holding tight onto it. We're not just bobbing in the ocean saying, oh, well, it's over there someplace. Whoop, there's a wave, can't see it. Oh, there it is. 
Right? No, we're, we're, we're cleaving unto it. We're, we're abiding with it. Barnabas here is encouraging them to remain. With everything they had, hold on, Barnabas is saying. And he's encouraging them in this light. You and I should do the same. Encourage others to remain strong. How was your week? Oh, it was a rough week. Right? Satan was, Satan's temptations, and he was throwing bombs all over the place this last week. Encourage them. Encourage them to, to hold on, to not lose hope. Remind them of a verse or two. We, we all need that at times. We all need that kind of encouragement at times. And here we see Barnabas doing just that. They, they, were, they were doing okay, but he came in and sort of gave them this, this boost. He encouraged them to remain. In our conversations with others that God is calling and working with, we too should be a Barnabas by encouraging them to remain, to abide in God, to cleave to him, to not let go, to hold on with everything they have, to persevere. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3, here this is, verse 11 is in the middle of the church at Philadelphia. We've gone through these letters um, in a recent sermon series. But notice verse 11 here, uh, speaking to the church at Philadelphia, Revelation 3 and verse 11. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have. This sort of reminds us of this visual concept of cleaving, right? If we don't swim very well, maybe we don't swim at all, right? and we're in a body of water, right? we, we cleave onto that life vest, don't we? <laughs> maybe you've known someone, or maybe you yourself are in that situation. You end up in a body of water, and you've got a life vest. You're holding on to it, right? It might be zipped and buckled and strapped and between the legs and all of this, Right? It might not be coming off, but you're still holding on to it. Right? <laughs> you're, you're cleaving to that. Spiritually speaking, we should do the same with God's way of life. Right? Hold fast what you have. Cleave to it that no one may take your crown. Right? This is encouraging us to remain, but, but we, should have, we should take those opportunities to do this for others as well. I'm sorry it's been a rough week. That must have been super difficult to go through those trials. But I'm glad you're here. Right? I'm glad you're here because this is where you need to be. Right? Encourage others to remain. Let's remind each other of the purpose why we're here. This is not just a networking event. Right? Oh, as soon as the Sabbath is over, I've got my list of business cards ready. Right? No. We're, we're here to be taught by God and to have the opportunity to encourage each other and, and further stitch those lives together. Let's remind each other what's in store for those who remain loyal to God. Yes, it was a hard week, but don't forget the future. Hang in there. Be strong. Remember these tools that God has given to you to, to withhold these fiery darts from Satan. Talk about the prize. Remind each other of it in, in difficult times, in challenging times. Because those things will only increase. The days and weeks that are difficult and, and challenging will only increase. The weeks will get harder. The distractions will become more predominant. It's good to encourage one another to remain Sports and hobbies and gardening, those, those are fun topics to talk about. But let's be careful that, that our conversations within the house of God are not just on those physical things. It's not a, a favorite sports team that binds us together. It's not dirt and planting, planting vegetables and watching them come to harvest. That's not what binds us together. 
right? It's not remodel projects. It's not this or that or car talk or uh, those things can be fun and, and we can find those, that level of commonality uh, among us. But what binds us together is God's spirit. Right? That's what binds us. So let's make sure that that's the focus, not just on the Sabbath, but throughout the week as well, that we're reminding each other and coming back to that, that commonality that's between us. God's spirit is what connects us. It's what binds us together. Some like sports, some don't. Some like to get their hands dirty and dirt underneath the fingernails and plant gardens. Others don't. Some like to get under the hood. Others don't. We, we all have our, our physical things of likes and dislikes and skills that we're good at and others that we're not. But it, God's spirit, though, that's the beautiful commonality between all of us. Right? And the secondary commonality is that it's God that has given us that spirit. Right? I didn't give it to some, and a different minister gave it to others, and somebody else gave it to somebody else, and somebody moves in from another area, and they've got somebody else's spirit that they gave to them. Uh-uh. It's all God's spirit. Right? That's what binds us together. Let's go back to Ephesians one more time. Maybe we should have put a, a ribbon here. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, breaking in here to verse 1. Paul says, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is the bonding agent. It's God's Spirit that binds us and brings us together and, and allows those, those threads to be stitched together. The word endeavoring here in the New King James Bible means to give diligence. I mean, we can't just sit back and, and expect it to sort of come our way. We have to be diligent about it. It takes effort. It's something we have to give focus to and attention we give diligence to that unity of the Spirit. We, we might think that we have God's Spirit. We have to work to acknowledge that in others. I see God working in your life. Yes, it's been a hard week, but you know, the way you're describing it to me, God was with you through that. God protected you through that week. Let's be thankful to God for that. Use, use our words of encouragement in order to continue this promoting of the unity of God's Spirit among us. Let's be reminded that that's truly what binds us. Not just that we go to church on Saturday, but it's God's Spirit that binds us. As we begin to conclude here this afternoon, let's Let's practice being an encourager. It takes work. Someone comes up and says, hi, good to see you, happy Sabbath. And we say, oh, it's so great to see you. And here's, let, let me dump out this, this bucket of all of my past week issues. <laughs> oh, thanks, good to see you too. <laughs> Let's practice being an encourager. It's a give and take, right? We, we, we each have challenges. We each face Satan's fiery darts. We each have good weeks and challenging weeks and sometimes weeks that we just maybe wish never happened. Let's practice being an encourager. Take the opportunities to encourage each other. Let's take those opportunities. Someone comes and begins to express some challenges and frustrations they have and difficulties of that day or whatever that night or that morning whatever the case might be take the opportunity to redirect them back to the bible oh sounds like that's been a real challenge this verse just came to my mind <laughs> right here's what god says right? Let, let's take comfort in that i'll keep you on my prayers right? this life is not an easy life for us as as true Christians, it's not an easy life. It was never meant to be. We weren't called to an easy life. Remember, Jesus Christ said the road is narrow and difficult, and 
there's few who find it. If we want it easy, that's a different road. That's broad and wide, leads to destruction, but nonetheless, that's the easy road. Some have family issues, some have problems at work, challenges at school, some have a difficult home life. Others have health difficulties either within their own bodies or within someone they, they love. Many of us can easily lose focus in the vision even of why we're here. It's easy to focus on the negative and all the wrong things in our life. It's easy to get into those depressive states where, where we think it's just, it's all piling down. And at those times, it's great to have that friend step in and say, hey, I was reading this verse this morning. I, I thought of you. Right Here, let's consider this. Remember what God is doing in your life. Let's pray and ask God to give us encouraging words and thoughts toward others. No one is perfect. Sometimes we get on each other's nerves, but this is all part of growing in God's character. To realize those things and to be able to put them in the proper place and ask God to help us work through that. Well, let's pray and ask God to give us those words of encouragement. Let's pray and ask God to give us the realization that maybe the person we're talking to needs some level of encouraging, some kind words of remaining, or that their growth is meaningful, that they are growing. Sometimes we don't know what the other person is facing, and it's good for us to sometimes to, to, to stop and listen, to stop and listen. And the third one here uh, for praying, pray and ask God to give us encouraging words. Number two, the realization that maybe the person we're talking to needs to be, have some level of encouragement. But number three, pray and ask God to help us conduct everything we do as an encourager. Let that become part of who we are. Like, oh, there's four eyes or there's freckles or there's spiky hair or there's slim or whatever our our traditional nicknames have, are that have been given to us, let encourager be one that, that is developing within us. Sometimes we might say something to someone and later that person comes back around and says, you may not remember that conversation we had last week, but right, that was really helpful. And you kind of think back, I don't even remember what I said. I don't remember the conversation. But God inspired the words to be helpful to that person. God can help fill in those blanks and, and can help inspire what might be said to the right person at the right time. Let's turn for our, our last verse back to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. The word comfort here means encouragement. Through the patience and encouragement of the scriptures. Is there encouragement in the, of the, in the scriptures? For sure, there's great encouragement in the scriptures. There's great things that we can learn in the scriptures. There's great ways in the scriptures to find our sins and to teach us and show us who our God is. The scripture is full of all sorts of, of topics related to our spiritual health and growth and development. But there's encouragement there as well. As Paul concludes here in verse 4, that we might have hope. It's not an encouragement to... Get out there and write the right numbers down for the lottery ticket. And here's hoping you win. It's not that kind of encouragement. This is encouragement toward eternal life. Encouragement toward fulfilling the purpose that God has called us to. Verse 5. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another. Be like-minded. We all have days that 
that, that we could use some encouraging, and we all have days that, that we can be that encourager, that, that God can work through us to provide the right words and, and the right refocus to that person we're talking to. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's that common spirit that's stitched in. That one mind, one mouth, and we're glorifying God. We're encouraging each other. We're there. We're stitched. We're, we're that, that tightly knit fabric that, that God is looking for that's clean and white. Barnabas has the nickname of encourager. Let's realize the importance of encouraging others and rejoicing in their growth. It's good to even point out that growth in them. Encourage others to remain strong and to remain faithful through the difficult times of their life. Keep in mind the tremendous potential that is in them as a member of God's family. And thirdly, let's encourage others to remain in the faith that they have been called to. Because, after all, this is a very special calling from God.